Oh, calm down. Thank you all very much for coming along for an exciting evening of uh, mathematics. My name is uh, Matt Parker. I used to be a math teacher, which is why I know that person is on their phone while I'm talking, honestly. <laughs> Unbelievable. Once a teacher, always a teacher. Uh, so can you all hear me adequately loud, amplified through the microphone? Excellent. People at the top, we're all happy. Marvellous. Right, so the plan for tonight, as uh, Peter very kindly said in his introduction, and then went home. Oh, that's a big vote of confidence in tonight's talk. Uh, as he very kindly said, I do a wide range of things involving uh, promoting mathematics or just generally trying to get more people more excited about maths. And I do things like YouTube videos, which is where I suspect the vast majority of the young people know me from. And I do BBC Radio 4, which is the rest of you. So <laughs> I, I cover the whole spectrum. Um, and so I recently wrote a book, uh, Humble Pie. And I'd written one book previously uh, called Things to Make and Do in the Fourth Dimension, which, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, is currently the second most viewed video on the RI channel, despite the fact that it's all abstract mathematics. And I figure tonight, with some applied mathematics, I'm taking number one. So uh, I wrote the first book, and Penguin, the publishers, were like, uh, would you like to write a second book? And the problem with things to make and do in the fourth dimension is, even though I was incredibly proud of it, and even though it sold very well for a maths book, it sold average for a book. Right, which is great, right? Average is, I'm above 50% of books. I'm very happy with that, right? But Penguin don't care what's in the book, right? They could publish, you know, another celebrity cookbook or anything. I mean, that's the one option, actually. And so I had to convince them it was a good decision to publish a book about mathematics. And so I suggested to them I could write a book all about my favorite mathematics mistakes, which is where Humble Pie, a, a comedy of maths errors, came about. And they liked that because people like tales of disaster. They like stories of things going wrong. They enjoy laughing at other people. Um, <laughs> I've made a career of being on the receiving end of that. And so I, and they said, yes, write that book. That's great. People who aren't specifically math nerds, which is their polite way of describing my target demographic, right? People will still enjoy reading these stories. And my ulterior motive was by showing examples of where maths goes wrong in everything from finance, engineering, you know, statistics, medicine, you name it. I can show, it's an excuse to talk about the math that's required for these areas of our modern society, right? And so obviously math works pretty flawlessly most of the time, so much so that most people have no idea how dependent we are on mathematics, and people often don't value math for that reason. So I thought this is a great excuse to just talk about all the places math is used, but by using things going wrong as, as my way in. And actually, I, because I used to be a math teacher, actually, uh, give me a cheer, any math teachers in? Hiding at the top, not sounding exciting. That's, it's the end of half term, isn't it? Right, okay, there you are. Uh, so I used to be a math teacher, just like the fine people cowering at the top of the room. And I, uh, then I, I, I left teaching, but I still remembered how a lot of young people, because when you're at school, you're forced to do maths, right? When you're forced to do it, a lot of people perceive mathematics as a subject where you have to get it right. Getting the right answer is everything. It's the be-all, end-all of mathematics. And as a teacher, you know that that's not always strictly true, right? Maths is about trying something and getting it wrong, and then trying it again and hopefully getting it less wrong, and then more wrong, and hopefully it converges in on the minimal amount of wrong possible. But it's a long, slow process of not understanding it and not doing it well. And it's always very disappointing when students, or even people in, in you know, standard issue humans, are afraid to try some maths because they think if they don't get the right answer, they haven't done it correctly. And that's not true. If you get the wrong answer, you may still be correct and you're trying it, right? Mathematics is about learning and teaching your brain how to think. And so I thought, okay, how can I kind of bring that approach to what will otherwise just be a random collection of math mistakes that haven't got any real meaning? And, you know, 
Uh, I started with an inspirational poster that I had when I was a teacher. And uh, the, the inspirational posters are the staple of the teaching world. It's what you decorate your classroom with. And this was one of my absolute favorites. They are, education works best when all the parts are working. Now, let me just break this down for you. So, you've got cogs representing students, teachers, and parents. And the trouble is, when that big cog on the right, which represents students, if that rotates, let's say, clockwise, because it meshes with teachers, teachers have to rotate anti-clockwise. That's all very nice. But neither of them are going anywhere because parents are jamming up the whole system. <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly... More applaud from the teachers than the parents. Uh, surprisingly accurate poster in my humble experience. Right? And then obviously people just haven't thought through the geometry of this situation. Right? If you have cogs, they have to go clockwise, anti-clockwise, clockwise, anti-clockwise. Anti so when Manchester were unveiling their new approach to public transport, they went with the classic <laughs> three cog, making the city work together. Although people did point out and proceed to render in 3D, that that's just this one point of view. Possibly from the side, it's fine. It's like, well played, well played. If all you see is this, right, you don't, look, that's deep. That's, they, they were thinking, they were several steps ahead. <laughs> Until I saw an article where uh, President Trump in the United States was negotiating the North America Free Trade Agreement, and when that was put in the newspapers, to show how all the working parts of North America should be moving in unison. Papers use this illustration, <laughs> where you've already used your third dimension, right? You're not getting that back. So <laughs> I paid money. I paid good money to license that image, to put it in my book, just so I could use the caption, making cogs great again. So <laughs> totally worth it. And uh, finally, two pound coins. When the two pound coin came out to celebrate the millennium, so there was a competition to design it. This was the winning entry, and it's got different concentric, I guess, circles, uh, bits, where it shows different stages of UK history. And the middle one, your kind of mechanical age here, is a series of cogs. And because if a cog goes clockwise, the one next to it has to go anti-clockwise, then clockwise, anti-clockwise, you have to have an even number of cogs as you go around. The two pound coin has an odd number of cogs. <laughs> it would not work. People on the internet were unimpressed uh, and smug in equal measure. And the Royal Mint put out a statement saying that it doesn't matter, right? It's just, what are you going on about? It's just meant to represent that age. And I was like, that's curious, but I wonder, because it's a 50-50 um, I don't know what would be a great example to simulate a 50-50 chance. Imagine flipping something, right? It could, <laughs> it could go either way. If you, if you do it at random, you get an odd or an even number of cogs. And so I looked up the person who designed this coin, a guy called Bruce Russian. He's an art teacher in Norfolk, and on his website, he's got his original design, which would have worked. It's an even number of cogs. The actual coin that was made, these three cogs were removed, which meant that it wouldn't work. I was like, wow, he, like he had it right, and the Royal Mint broke it. But was that deliberate? So I sent him an email. I was like, hey, I'm really sorry. I'm sure people have pointed this out. I'm just curious, because I noticed you got it right. Was that deliberate? Did you think about it? Was it a concern? What, what happened? I'm writing a book about mass mistakes. I'm curious to know what was your thought process. And he replied to say that he didn't think, as an artist, it should have to be correct. He thought it's representative, a bunch of cogs. It doesn't make a difference to the artistic worth of the design. And to be honest, I kind of agree with him. He then said that he decided to make it work anyway, because otherwise, he would get loads of annoying emails from parents. <laughs> I don't know why that bit was in bold, uh, but there you go. Uh, so, and so, yeah, so he just thought, oh, people are going to complain. They're going to go on and on about it. And now this, this is the unfortunate edge, because when I was writing a book about mass mistakes, I didn't want it to be all about niche theoretical mass problems, of which there are things people thought they proved something and they hadn't. And that's interesting to a, a small demographic that includes this guy. But then there's also the kind of pedantic, ah, you're wrong, I'm right, right? Which is the opposite of it's fine to make mistakes, which is one of the things I want to get across. Um, and a lot of mistakes don't really matter. So uh, this, I hunted down a copy of this book. I remembered this. 
uh, from years and years and years ago. I forget where I, I didn't have it as a child. I must have seen some, I mean, a lot of my friends procreate, and I saw somewhere this book. This is a Sesame Street book. This is Ernie uh, expressing his uh, dislike of the possibility of being forced to live on the moon, which feels like a niche concern, but there you go. And I, uh, I hunted down a copy of this book. I found it on the internet, and there's one thing about this which really bothers me. It's not important. It's not a major issue. Does anyone, apart from the child who had a very loud epiphany over there, like to tell me, what's wrong with it? There's stars where the moon should be. You are 100% correct. What are these? <laughs> There's not a hole in the moon. As far as I'm aware, in the extended Sesame Street universe, there are not Muppet bases that we can see twinkling on the moon, right? And so you often see a crescent moon, and then you see stars shining through it. And no, the moon is, well, from our point of view, a disk, right? And it's always there. It blocks out the stars. We do see different bits depending on how it's lit, and that's an artistic version of that. <laughs> Bizarrely, I'm fine with that, right? But I'm like, they, they, they shouldn't show stars through the crescent moon, right? Come on, bit of astronomy, everybody. Um, and then I was looking around for other examples. And actually, Sesame Street have done this more than once. And <laughs> I was looking at, separately, the license plates from the state of uh, Texas. So this is a plate from Texas. And as you can see, it's celebrating the fact that the shuttle was involved in Texas. And there's the shuttle. That's not a bad angle, actually, for the shuttle taking off. That's surprisingly. It's already, it hasn't got any of its boosters or anything. So I, it should, maybe that's it landing. I don't know. I was distracted by, over here, that star. That star is dangerously close to that. <laughs> but the only way I could know for sure would be to somehow buy some license plates from Texas. So I did that. <laughs> and they arrived in the post. There we are. Uh, these, this is actually genuinely... I scanned it so I could get a high-resolution version because all the ones online were too low res. And if you zoom right in and you fill in the rest of the moon... Texas, <laughs> undone by a lone star. Um, so, oh, so people have since pointed out that maybe it's marking where the first uh, Apollo landing site was, and it's very close. <laughs> I might give them that, to be entirely honest. Right, but these, these problems, these two, they're not... Okay, if we're just talking about are there practical implications for the problems? In this case, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of getting mass correct and good mass PR and mass being important. But just practically, are they important? And, and sadly, in those cases, not really, not really important. Um, but sometimes the mass can be important. So you may have noticed I am dancing around a very large Jenga tower. Um, and I thought I'd have this set up during my show uh, to artificially increase the amount of suspense <laughs> for narrative purposes. No, so, uh, so this is to show a, a fantastic effect uh, about resonance. So, this is a building, and we're going to show you in a second how a building resonates, hopefully, to destruction. We will see how lucky we get, or unlucky, depending on what I'm trying to do at the time. Uh, normally, you will hear resonance discussed when it comes to bridges, and so there are a lot of bridges which have had resonance problems dating back into, I think the earliest one I've come across was in the 1800s, up near um, Manchester, where um, Salford is now, there was a bridge and there were some troops marching over the bridge because they were all in step. They hit a resonance frequency of the bridge. And the bridge started to move, which apparently they thought was kind of fun. So they started singing a tune to match the bouncing bridge, really got involved, and it collapsed. And <laughs> no one died. No one died. It's okay. Um, it's difficult writing, because you do when you cover engineering and medical mistakes. When I was putting the book together, like, I'm like, every second story, everybody dies. <laughs> I can't have a comedy book about maths, and every second, every, every couple pages, and then everybody died. Right? <laughs> so I think, in all the engineering examples I'm going to give you, nobody died. I think. And all the aviation stories in the book, nobody died. Don't get me wrong, people do die in aviation problems, just not the ones I put in the book. Uh, so that was the problem with the bridge uh, up near Manchester. In London, you've still got this one here. This is the Albert Bridge. Uh, all troops must break step when marching over this bridge. That sign is still there. Troops are, they must break step. Uh, interestingly, though, they must not break dance. Very different rule. <laughs> um, 
And uh, when I mention this, a lot of you are now thinking of one of two famous bridges, uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge. This was a bridge in the US, Art Deco Bridge, absolutely phenomenal, incredible amount of twist. Now, that's not your standard resonance from just people marching on it or even bursts of wind, as you will occasionally read online. This is resonating, but this is flutter. This is aerodynamic flutter from the wind coming up the valley where it was. And the flutter basically caused this runaway feedback loop, whereas the lift bridge came up, more wind pushed it higher up. When it finally bounced back and down, more wind pushed it down. And you got this uh, feedback, which led it to uh, go more and more. Um, Someone finally decided maybe they should leave their car. Um, you'll also, you've got the Millennium Bridge in London. This was opened in uh, the year 2000, and it was only open for a couple of days before they had to close it. They looked at the footage. Now, if everyone's walking randomly, it should be fine, because no, they're not all going to match one particular frequency. But they looked at the footage, about 20% of the pedestrians, admittedly it's quite crowded, but 20% of them were all marching in sync. The bridge is moving about seven and a half centimeters either way, right? Which is about seven and a half too many. And so they had to close it and do all sorts of crazy things to damp it. Because what was happening was the bridge was moving a bit and people were moving with it. And so they were then stepping in time with the bridge. So the bridge moving was causing the pedestrians to synchronize and the pedestrians synchronizing was causing the bridge to move. And you get this um, feedback loop. The official wording was, it was synchronous lateral excitation. Right? <laughs> If it was a feedback, energy was going in and it was matching a resonant frequency, uh, which is, of course, uh, totally terrifying. I'm more interested, though. I've, I've become obsessed with bridges are one thing. They're easy to move. And we kind, for the most part now, we get, which is why the Millennium Bridge was so amazing. For the most part now, bridges work fine. Buildings, less so. So, there was a building in South Korea in 2011, which is disturbingly recent. Anything within a decade I find terrifying. It was a 39-story building. And one day, in 2011, the people on the 38th floor evacuated because they thought there was an earthquake or something. It was shaking like crazy. They left the building. No one else knew what they were going on about. The building was fine. Now, what? They did an investigation, and they recreated this. So, this is genuinely true. It turns out, on the 12th floor was an exercise class. <laughs> and about 20 people decided to exercise to a different song that day. They exercised to Snaps, I've Got the Power. <laughs> if you're unfamiliar with Snaps, I've Got the Power, that would be better if it was a dramatic... Uh, <laughs> if you're unfamiliar with Snaps, I've Got the Power, and that's as much as I can play without the Royal Institution getting a copyright strike on their channel. So uh, th they danced to that song. The song happened to match the resonant frequency of the building, and the 38th floor moved 10 times more than normal. Absolutely incredible. So when people design buildings, they have to try and factor this in, and it is a big problem, which is what this is actually kind of a teaching aid for learning about resonance in building. And I've borrowed this off a friend of mine who is an engineer, and they've actually come along to give me a hand, because I am not qualified to run this, uh, and see what it can show us about resonance. So uh, can you please welcome to the stage from the University of Bath, Paul Shepherd. There he is. Well, welcome. I haven't seen you since we put this back together. Okay, it's been minutes. So, don't pick that up yet, I get nervous. Okay, so, first of all, first of all what do you do at the University of Bath? Uh, I teach mathematics to civil engineers. I research how we can use computers to design better buildings. And I've also got a role in our institution, Institute of Mathematical Innovation, helping companies with their maths problems. Fantastic. No, how he, he started and ended with maths to keep me happy. So uh, you use this in your lectures, I believe. Yes. And just talk us through, what is this bit of kit? Um, literally, it's a washing machine motor, but let's not go there, right? It there's, really is. There's it's a washing ma machine motor in a box. See, there's some magic in the box. It causes the base to move back and forth, yep. vibrate. And I have here a button that you're not qualified to press. That's the one. And a dial to make it go faster or slower. Can we, is there like a safe slow, can we? We or, can do it really, Or do you want to leave really, it, what, what do you want no, to do? No, 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 it's Okay, fine. here we go, okay, so we we'll, 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 we'll show it in action. If it still works. I'll, I'll catch it, it if it goes to four. Really slow, yeah, like, you know. Oh, that is, that is fantastically slow. 
If anyone starts watching yeah, the video right now, they're like, it is playing at the wrong speed. Anyone's still um, awake. So that's it, right? And yeah. on top of this, we built a Jenga tower. Yeah. And what we wanted to demonstrate with this is that if you hit the resonant frequency of the Jenga tower, it will fall over. But to make it a challenge, first we're going to start with a frequency where it won't fall over. So we think we've found one. We're unconvinced. We yeah. put it back together and went, oh. Now it's subtly different, <laughs> and we'll have a slightly different resonant frequency. But let's give it a go. Let's give it a go. So should we, should we slam straight into the... Straight into the... Oh, my the, goodness. Right. You're, I'm yep. gonna yeah, I'm going to catch it just in case way, we yeah. get unlucky. Like if you get unlucky, it goes that way. Oh, yeah. If I get unlucky, <laughs> it goes that way. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Here we go. It's fine. Look at it. I would happily live in that building. <laughs> <laughs> so... So we've got it moving at quite a frequency. It's shaking. Don't get me wrong. It's shaking it all over the place, but it's not falling over. What we're going to do now is we're going to keep the amplitude the same because we can't adjust it, and we're going to reduce the frequency so we're shaking it less. So do you want to reduce slowly, the frequency? We're slowly, slowly bringing the frequency down. I'm so now well. you can stand back. There's now less shaking. Sorry. Wow, now I feel confident. Less shaking, and in theory, even though we're shaking it less, if we hit a resonant frequency, it will fall over. I think we're near one. Oh, 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 oh! Now, don't get me wrong, as we're shaking it slower, we're putting less energy into it. We were just putting the energy in at just the right time to build and accumulate in the system rather yeah. than cancelling out. And yeah. so, what, so you show this to what, civil engineering students? Yes. We, I mean, we don't want that to happen to buildings. And there's a certain number of things we can change to the building to make sure that the frequency at which it would do that is different from the frequencies that it would see in its daily life. Okay. So and we kind of tune it, the building, away from... And you don't test it by putting models on this? No. You run, like, simulations or something? We do maths on it. Oh, yes. Obviously. <laughs> Correct answer, Paul. <laughs> and are there any buildings, like, can you give us examples of buildings you've done this on? Or are you, are you like, un under a lot of non-disclosure agreements? Not anymore. <laughs> hey! <laughs> no, you're, I, you're an academic now. Well, I was working on a bridge, um, at the, I won't say which one, at the same time as the wobbly bridge across the Thames had problems. Oh, really? So we were working, I was working for, let's say, a different company. And of course, we watched that and thought, well, we better make <laughs> trebly sure that we're not going to fall for this. You're like, whoops, glad it happened yeah. to them first. So, I mean, it, it did take the world of engineering a little bit by surprise that it had happened so seriously. So, yeah, we... You know, we, we, we can now understand. It was the person element that we, we knew the maths, but we didn't quite understand how people synchronize. They're the un unpredictable ones. And now, in the two decades since, when people design bridges, do you, or any, any building, I guess, do you have to now factor in human movement as well? Yeah, after that happened, a lot of people did a lot of experiments and research to work out how it happens and to quantify it. And now that sort of new research is taken into account when we design bridges today. Oh, fantastic. Excellent. Can we have a huge round of applause for Paul Shepard? Thank you. All right. I mean, he's literally just sat over there now. Okay, so, uh, but his mic has been turned off. Okay, right. So, um, so I think this is great because the thing about engineering is we're often building things beyond our current full mathematical understanding, right? We use maths to build things which no longer make sense intuitively. Because if you look at something like the Millennium Bridge, you can't just go, that will wobble or that won't. Or indeed, most of the perfectly stable buildings, before we had computers and advanced maths, we built them out of massive bits of rocks where you can look at it and go, yep, that's not going anywhere, right? Whereas now, we need computers and mathematics to check. And occasionally, things go wrong. We will uh, forget about a factor or there's a new bit of mathematical behavior will emerge. And then the en engineering industry learns, improves, and the maths is developed, and we carry on building more and more ridiculous things. Okay, so I'm going to leave these here and continue to carefully dance uh, around them. What I thought I would do, because I've got, I've got one more guest at the end who's uh, brought something else along to show you, but between now and then, 
I had so many stories, because this, like, I just had hundreds and hundreds of stories, of which a couple hundred made it into the book, and I couldn't decide which ones I was going to show you here today. So what I thought I would do is pick them at random. So I have here a spinning wheel. And so what we can do is, if we spin the wheel, right, it'll settle on, on one of the colors. This is not it. We'll do it again in a second. So we get a color. And up here, I've got a breakdown of what the colors mean. So we would do a story about uh, programming, right? Boom. Programming story. I get a programming story on the laptop. We do it. We have a great time. We do this a few times. Then we bring on the final guest. Very straightforward. So I'm going to get some volunteers to come down and... No, not yet. You haven't heard all the rules. Uh, I'm gonna th I think I'm going to do this three times. That's my guess, three times. And so my plan is, if we have three different volunteers, we will start with a very young volunteer. We will then have more of a uh, teenage high school volunteer, and then we'll have an adult volunteer. So if people watch this quickly, or they just, or it's edited down, it will look like the one volunteer aging rapidly <laughs> throughout the talk. Okay, so uh, are there any... Wait to the end of the sentence. Any young volunteers who would like to come down and be first? Uh, over there, uh, right at the back. Give me a wave. You get a round of applause. Come on down. <laughs> Hi. Very nice to meet you. What's your name? Maria. Maria, nice to meet you. Would you like to come over here, Maria? So you can see I've got my spinner here. What I want you to do is to grab one of these and just give it a real spin, and we'll see which of any of the colors it ends up on. Off you go. Good spin. Whatever color it is, just say the category nice and loud. Oh, it's just in green. What's green? Probability. Thank you very much. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Give me a second to find my probability slides. There we go. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with a, a tale about probability and how humans are bad at probability. And this is one of my favorite examples where we can try to uh, scam someone, right? We can try and uh, trick someone into uh, thinking it's a fair game when actually it's not. So uh, for this, I need a volunteer. However, I'm going to take one from someone right up the top. Is there anyone, because you don't have to come down for this. You, you remain uh, completely in situ. Let's go with uh, the person over there, leaning on the rail at the back. Yep, give me a wave. Excellent. What's your name very loud? Yeah, we can't hear you. Okay, so, um, so what we're going to do, right, we're going to flip a coin down here. It's going to be heads or tails, right, and you're going to try and predict if it's heads or tails. Has anyone down here got a coin? Any of the adults got a coin they're prepared uh, to flip for me? So are you, happy, are you happy to be our coin flipper? Okay, you can stay there. You flip the coin. Very straightforward. Okay, right. So what we're going to do is we're going to flip the coin. You're going to predict it. Would you like heads or tails? You feel like this is going to be a double-sided coin. <laughs> I, I feel like we're having more of a conversation than I expected. <laughs> Let's have a look. Give me the coin. Oh, my goodness. Okay, ready? <laughs> uh, can, uh, who would you like to verify the coin? Pick a human. The one next to you. Pick a human who's closer to me than you. It's okay. I've got a solution. Don't worry. Would anyone like to... No. Okay. Okay. Who? Who? There? There. That one. Okay. Can you have a look at that? Is it, is it, a, is it a head on both sides? No. no. Is it tails on one side? Yes. Excellent. Wow. That was anticlimactic. <laughs> Here you are. You are now deemed trustworthy. <laughs> By simply saying either the word heads... All the word tails. What do you think it's going to be? Tails. Okay, everyone in your own minds decide what you think it's going to be. Heads or tails in your own minds. Okay. Flip it and then call it out nice and nice so we can all hear it. Good flip. Solid flip. What is it? <laughs> tails. Who's right? Hands up if you're right. Okay, half of you. Hands up if you're wrong. Okay, okay. Slightly more because, you know, adorable kid. Okay. <laughs> so, was that fair though? 
And by the way, it's not a trick coin. There's nothing fancy going on. It's not because there's more metal on one side than the other, right? Assuming that is a perfectly fair coin, everyone should be happy that was a perfectly fair challenge. In fact, if we were to bet money, which young people, you shouldn't, right? But were you to do such a thing, you would have a 50-50 chance of winning versus losing. And if you played it over and over again, you would win as often as you lose, or you play the same person, you would end up passing money back pretty much at random, right? No one has an advantage in that game. We could make the game slightly more exciting by having uh, more than one flip. So if instead of asking you what one flip would be, I could say, uh, we're going to flip it We'll, we'll do two flips, so you can choose heads, heads, or heads, tails, or tails, heads, or tails, tails. Hey, what would you like, actually? What would you like? Tails, tails, right? And everyone here could think of their own, um, their own one that they want to have, and if we, we flipped it, you've all got a one in four chance of being right. Or if we're playing two of us, if we don't get it straight away, we could keep flipping it until one of us has our run come up first. Still a fair coin, must be still fair. What if we did three? In fact, everyone, in your own minds, decide what three flips in a row. Heads, tails, heads, tails, 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 heads, tails, tails, right? What, what do you, in your own minds, decide what you think it's going to be. What, what, did, what did you decide up there? Tails, tails, you get one more. Heads, tails, tails, heads, right? In fact, here they all are. There's all the options. So you may have picked one of those and um, they're all equally likely. I'm now going to bet all of you simultaneously that mine will come up before yours. So I want you to have a look at this, and I want you to choose which one is yours. Make sure you choose which one is yours. And then I'm going to add my predictions next to yours. So if you predicted heads, heads, tails, I predict tails, heads, heads, because I'm playing you all individually. If you pick tails, tails, heads, I've picked heads, tails, tails. I have different predictions. I mean, some of them are the same, but I mix up the predictions based on what you said. So everyone, make sure you're happy. Which one is yours and my prediction next to it? You all got that. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to start flipping the coin until either you win or I win, and we'll keep going until every single game is finished. So, first one up. Flip the coin. What have you got? Heads. Second one. Oh, third one. Tails. So, a lot of people are now happy they've just won. If you said heads, heads, tails, you have uh, just beaten me. I said ta tails, heads, heads, which has not come up. But some people, yours isn't here yet. So tell me, can you flip it again? Great, I love it. You're being uh, more enthusiastic each time. Tails. tails. So now, can you see the last three are now heads, tails, tails. So if you had heads, tails, tails, you have now won. If I had heads, tails, tails, I've now won. Or if I had heads, heads, tails against yours, I've now won. You need to keep track who wins first, you or me. So if either I beat you with heads, heads, tails, or I've beaten you with heads, tails, tails, just bear that in mind. Okay, give us another flip. Heads. So the next one up is tails, tails, heads. Tails, tails, heads. Up next. Tails, heads, tails. Tails, heads, tails. Tails, heads, tails. Okay. Heads, tails, tails. Heads, tails, tails. Is anyone still in the game? What are you thinking of? Which one's yours? Heads, heads, heads. And what did I predict against that? Tails, heads, heads. That hasn't come up. Oh, my goodness. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, next one. Who's going to win? Heads. Tails, tails, heads. Tails, heads, tails. They're still both in the competition. Someone else has either won or gone out, right? Yep. Heads. Tails, heads. It's the beginning of your run. Here we go. Oh, but you're about to win. Oh. Is, it, is anyone still in the game? What were you on? Uh, heads, tails, heads. I predicted heads, heads, tails, which was the first one out. So it's fine. Don't worry. We'll edit this out of the video. We're not going to edit it out of the video. So very quickly, before when it was heads or tails, roughly half the audience, roughly, got it correct. Put your hand up if I won the game against you. 
That's the vast majority of you. And hands up if you won. Oh, a few people. Okay, what did you, what the people who picked me, what did you go for? Heads, heads, tails, which was straight out of the gate, right? So one in eight of you will win straight out of the gate. If you play this game over and over and the person you're playing against picks randomly, I will win 74% of the time. Roughly three quarters of a time, the one I've put in white will beat the one in orange next to it. And the reason this works... And the reason it's not fair is we don't flip the coin three times and then start again. If we did it three times, start again, three times, start again, it would be perfectly fair. Because they're overlapping, they're no longer independent probabilities. They're now dependent probabilities. And if you look at mine, all of mine will mine all end in what your prediction starts with. I'm trying to make mine happen right before yours, which is why I got yours, because I knew if you've got heads, 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 unless the first three flips are heads, 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 I'm going to win, because tails, heads, heads will always come first. So let's say we've been flipping the coin for ages, and someone picked all tails, the opposite of you, and someone picked, uh, I picked heads, tails, tails. If the coin's been flip, 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 and you're like, ah, here we go, at last, it's going to be tails, 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 as soon as you get the first two in the run, I've already won. Unless the first three flips are tails, 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 or heads, 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 you cannot win. So there's a one in eight chance you will win, and there's a seven in eight chance I will win. And the other ones are different variations on that theme with different probabilities. And if you average them all, you get the 74% figure. And, and people don't really think through when you get these unusual probabilities uh, combining. I actually I carry with me a set of dice. Um, which I thought I'd get out if we have probability on the spinner wheel. These are called uh, grime dice, and they have unusual numbers on them. And I appreciate you can't really see them, so I've got a shot up on the screen here. So the yellow one you can see there has got, uh, what's that? It's got an eight, it's got some threes. The green has got a zero. What's going on there? Right? They've got crazy numbers on them. They're not one to six. And the game you play is choose a dice. So you pick one color, I pick a different color, we roll them together, highest number wins. Very straightforward, right? Except they're not all equally likely to win because they've got different numbers. But it's very hard to tell at a glance which is the best dice. I can now reveal to you that if you roll the red one versus the blue one, the red one will win more often than the blue. Not all the time but more often, it's above 50%. The blue one wins more often than the green, the green wins more often than the yellow, yellow wins more often than magenta, and so you get this fantastic ordering from the best dice, which is the red, down to the worst dice, which is the magenta. Or so you would think. If you play magenta versus red, the magenta wins more often than the red one. There's no best dice. If you remember this cycle and the person you're playing picks first, you can always pick a dice which has a higher probability of winning than they do. Same as the dice game, penny ante, right? You, as long as the other person picks first, you can always pick one that's better, which feels weird, but it's the same as rock, paper, scissors. It's like paying rock, paper, scissors, but go, you go first and then I'll choose. <laughs> There's no best option, but each one's better than another one, and each one loses to another one. Same deal on a, on a, on a higher scale. If you do play this, though, it gets a bit terrifying, because if people realize you're beating them, they will make you tell them the secret, and then you say, oh, okay, I'll teach you the secret, and now we'll play two dice together. Why not? What they won't realize is if you play two dice simultaneously, it reverses the order... <laughs> So they will now, you will pick first, and they will then deliberately pick the one that loses, because you've got two. So that's the single dice game. That's the double dice game. If you're wondering what on earth is going on here, I've got a quick equation. There you go. Huh? <laughs> It's also got more than one cycle, because there's another internal cycle of five in a different order. And if you double the dice, the internal cycle doesn't reverse. All it does is the top one becomes even. Uh, right, so there's the double dice, there's the single dice, and so the outside one's flipping, but the inside one isn't. If you're wondering what's going on there, there's the new equation. <laughs> All right, and I absolutely love them. Uh, if you want some um, details, they, the colors, I'm going to come up with the colors. A friend of mine, a guy called James Grime, did the numbers. I did the colors. I'm helping. Because <laughs> I said if they're these colors, then the length of the color goes up 
by one letter as you go around the outside cycle, which is why that's magenta, not purple. Purple has insufficient letters. And then James was like, well, if we make this one olive instead of green, the inner cycle is now alphabetical order. So, so you can now remember both cycles by looking at the colors. If you want all the stats, here are your advantages for any given pairing. The inner cycle is actually slightly stronger. The other one, here's all your numbers. Every single one is above 50%. Apart from, we couldn't quite get this one up to 50. It's just below. Because sadly, there's nothing magical about these dice. Um, there's no incredible mass property. It's just that when you put numbers on some dice, you, it's very hard to tell if they form a, a trans, non-transitive cycle or a transitive cycle. And non-transitive just means... Like, numbers are transitive because if three, let's say uh, seven is bigger than three, and three is bigger than one, then seven is bigger than one. It's a transitive property that passes down the chain. Just because, you know, red beats blue and blue beats green doesn't mean red beats green, right? It's not a property that gets passed down the chain. And it's things like this which uh, throw humans when we think we understand probability, but then it's just a little bit off. So... I think we've got time for another quick spin of the wheel. I need a teenager this time. Anyone prepared to come down and give me a hand? You look very keen right in the center. Would you like to come down and spin the wheel? You get the applause once you get to the aisle, not before. Nope. <laughs> it gets awkward. It gets awkward. Otherwise, we're just applauding other people awkwardly moving. It's not good. What was your name? Sasha. Sasha. Very nice to meet you, Sasha. So you saw how this goes. You grab it, you give it a spin. Whatever color it ends up on, you say very loudly what it was. Okay, off you go. Okay, and we're going to be talking about... Okay. Probability. Excellent. Round of applause for Sasha. <laughs> very much. Wow. What are the chances? Um, so... <laughs> Probability, I think I've got a second probability thing here. Give me a second, give me a... Oh, yeah, no, okay, this is kind of fun. Um, this, this is an old classic. So, way back in the distant past, 2010, I saw a newspaper story about someone who had analysed the locations of the ancient monolithic sites in the UK. And they realised that they formed patterns. Specifically, if you took the 1,500 main monolithic ancient sites, these are prehistoric sites, and you analysed their positions, they formed triangles. <laughs> More than that, they form, they form very precise triangles, isosceles triangles. Oh. Isosceles triangles where two sides are exactly the same length and they were within like half a percent, incredible precision. And the person who found this put out a press release. It was in all the papers. They claimed it was some kind of ancient sat nav and that they used these uh, geometric arrangements of monolithic sites to navigate across the United Kingdom. And uh, the researchers said that the results were so precise they could not have happened by accident. In fact, they couldn't rule out extraterrestrial help. So, I thought I would check. So I went and also got some ancient sites and started plotting them on a map of the United Kingdom. And the first three I came across around Birmingham formed a perfect equilateral triangle within the required half a percent. And then, I forgot, I added in more triangles. Uh, you've also got two isosceles triangles on either side, both within the half a percent. Another pair of isosceles triangles, both within the re required half a percent. The base and the perpendicular bisector go through four new locations. The location in Conaway is within 12 meters of this line. It then goes over 170 miles across the United Kingdom, right through the base of the triangle, hits Luton, where it's within nine meters of that spot. Incredibly precise patterns. And I was like, wow, this is... this." can't have happened by accident, except I wasn't analysing ancient monolithic sites. I had looked up the ancient Woolworth stores, <laughs> who had gone bankrupt slightly before. And we had already forgotten how the people of 2008 lived. I mean, how did they buy discount plastic goods and clothing? We just don't know. Uh, and for the young people who aren't familiar with Woolworths, they had a business model where they were like, let's just get all the confectionery and put it in open containers, let people help themselves, and assume nothing will go wrong with that business model. <laughs> they, 
right? So they went out of business. I found the uh, 800 Woolworths locations around the UK, and I analyzed them, and I found the same patterns to the same level of precision as the other person who had found who was claiming either ancient wisdom or, you know, uh, aliens or all these things, right? So I put out my findings as a press release uh, about how we could learn about the ancient Woolworths civilization. <laughs> um, the Guardian went with aliens found Woolworth civilization, which was pretty funny. Uh, it turns out there are just lots and lots of stores to choose from. So specifically, here are the ones I had with their postcodes. They're all legitimate stores. You can fact check this. But here are all the stores, right? If you've got, I, I checked the numbers. If you have 800 Woolworth stores, there are 85 million possible triangles. If you have 85 million triangles, it would be more amazing if none of them were isosceles, right? There are so many options. If you look hard enough, you will definitely find this pattern. Or any pattern of your... Mathematically, we can state you can find any pattern you want to any level of precision you want if you're prepared to ignore enough data. The 1,500 stores the other person had used gave them 561 million triangles. Of course, in 561 million triangles, there are going to be a few that line up, right? We're just ignoring loads of data and cherry-picking the little bits which confirm whatever our bias may be. And every so often, this person would put out more findings, and I would put out uh, other ridiculous press releases, <laughs> up to and including a programmer a friend of mine, a guy called Tom Scott, programmed a website based on the Woolworths thing, except he used monolithic sites and postcodes. So he found for every single postcode in the United Kingdom, there are three ley lines that go through it by joining up other monolithic sites, and one of them will be Stonehenge. Every single postcode. I can guarantee, you can now tell everyone, your house... Your postcode is definitely at the center of three ley lines, one of which goes through Stonehenge, because it's true of everywhere on the United Kingdom. Just a lot of old things are lying around, right? <laughs> and I, th I get so annoyed when people go, this data confirms whatever my theory is, and they're not asking how much data didn't confirm it. You always want to know, if you're doing good, proper science, how much you're ignoring, what your method was, how you can falsify what you believe, and then honestly and rigorously checking that, and then getting other people to check it, right? Don't leave it to people like me to make fun of you in the newspaper. Okay, I think we've got time for one, let's do one quick last uh, spin of the wheel, and then I'll bring on our final guest. So for this one, I need an adult who's prepared to come down. Is there anyone who's prepared to, I mean, you're practically here already. Give them a round of applause. Here they come. <laughs> I'm Matt. What was your name? Matthew, that's easy to remember. Okay, so Matthew, we're going to spin the wheel, whatever it lands on, we're going to talk about it. Off you go. Oh, is that just in probability? Yes! A round of applause for Matthew! No, it does land on the colours. Oh, well. Okay, so I'm very quickly going to talk about, wow, three. I didn't have a third probability. Oh, I have got one here. Let me get that. Um, I'm going to show you my all-time, uh, stay with me, everyone, my all-time uh, favourite photo. This is my absolute favourite photo. Uh, and this was taken in 1980. That is Donna. She was on a holiday uh, or vacation. She's North American, going to uh, one of the Disney World or lands. And when she was there, uh, she got this photo taken with uh, Smee. This is Smee, right? And the probability, the amazing thing about this is not that someone actually wanted a photograph with Smee, but what was happening in the background. Because many years later, she met her uh, fiancé, Alex, right? They obviously got engaged. And one day, she was showing Alex the photographs from her childhood, showed him this photograph, and he went, oh, that's odd. That looks like my dad. Wait. That's me! <laughs> she was accidentally photographed with the person she would later go on to marry decades before they actually met, right? And that's, that's amazing. Like, the media lost their minds. They're like, imagine being, imagine being in a photo as a kid and someone just wheels your future spouse into the background. It's, it's incredible. But I was like, nah, it's not fate. 
It's not romance, it's statistics. Because how likely is the... Okay, this is unlikely to happen to any one given human. Because over the course of your life, particularly now there are cameras absolutely everywhere, you'll be photographed with, I don't know, a thousand or so random people in backgrounds of photos. Who knows, right? Let's say about a thousand. And it's reasonably unlikely that you will go on to have a significant relationship with any of those random people. There's possibly billions of people that you could go on to have relationships with, right? And so a thousand out of billions, I mean, obviously it depends how big a, you know, how much mixing of the populations you're in, there are other factors, but it's very unlikely. Except it can happen to a lot of people. Right? It couldn't just happen to you, it could happen to everyone. It could happen to those billions of people. I would argue the population size cancels out. There should be thousands of photographs like this out there. Right? This is not amazing. We expect it to happen. We just don't expect it to happen to anyone specific. We wouldn't know who Donna and Alex are. They're just some random you know, North Americans. We'd have no idea. Right? It's only because the photograph happened. It's a bit like winning the lottery. Right? It's amazing if you win the lottery. That's incredible. It's not amazing if someone wins the lottery. You don't see the newspaper, oh my goodness, someone won the lottery again. Just keeps happening. Well, yes, millions of people play the lottery, right? People forget about how many opportunities these things have. And I went on tour a couple of years ago. I did a show called Number Ninja. And when I was on tour, I um, showed this photograph and talked about how likely I thought it was. And sure enough, in one show, someone came up to me and said, oh, this happened to some friends of mine. A friend of mine, uh, Kate, she met someone called Chris uh, in Sheffield in 1993. And they got engaged. And they went on a world tour to celebrate their engagement. And as they were traveling around the planet, they went to visit some distant, distant relatives of Kate's in outback Western Australia, which really is the middle of nowhere. Right? I've been there. right? And they were visiting one particular family on one particular farm. And uh, the, the wife in that family said, oh, uh, it's so great you're here. Um, my husband and I, we went to the UK once. Years ago, once, right? We took a whole bunch of photos, and we got one photo, one specific photo that we don't know where we took it. All the other ones, we've written the location on the back. This one, we have no idea. And they're like, oh, okay, well, let's, let's have a look, right? And so they went in, they got the photo, they pulled it out, and Chris looked at it and went, oh, that looks like, oh, that's Trafalgar Square, right? You're feeding the pigeons in Trafalgar Square. Wait a minute. That's me! <laughs> Right. Imagine traveling halfway around the world to be reminded of how much denim you wore as a kid. I mean, that's, <laughs> wow. And it was like the one time as a kid his family went down to London, happened to be photographed by a distant relative of the person he would go on to marry, and then it was the one photograph that they wanted to show you when you happened to visit in this other... It's just insane, right? And again, they showed this at their wedding about how incredible it was that they... Um, had this photo. And that's true. It is incredible for them. It's just not incredible that it happens. I always, you just got to remember how many opportunities things have to happen. In fact, you can kind of uh, exploit that. So I've got a, uh, this is an old school one pound coin, the old circular ones before they got rid of them. I'm going to flip it so it lands on its edge, right? So flip the coin, ban, land, edge. Okay, wouldn't, okay, <laughs> this would be a, okay, here we go. Ready? Ready? That's dangerously close. <laughs> oh! That's so close. Wouldn't that have been amazing? I mean, I thought I was just going to have to stand here doing the same thing over and over again, but no. Um, now, actually, that was the pound coin, I think, is the most likely thing to land on its edge. And just so you know, that doesn't always happen, by the way. There's not an edge. I happen to get lucky on the first flip, right? It genuinely does happen. I could actually, I could sit here for, ooh, that was close. I could sit here and flip it thousands of times. Eventually, it would land on its edge, which I know because I did. So, this was me flipping a coin until it lands on its edge. I wanted to see how many edges I could get. And some of them I wasn't sure if they should count or not. So, I want your opinion on this one. Okay, here we go. This is me flipping a coin so it lands on its edge. Flip the coin. Look at that. Wait. Wait. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Ah. Does that count? Vote, vote if you think that counts. Vote if you think it doesn't. You're right. It does not. <laughs> I kept going. I flipped this 
specific coin 10,000 times. <laughs> so, oh, I haven't put the video out yet. So people watching this, spoiler, don't tell anyone else. That video will be out soon. I flipped it because I did like funny videos like, here's a flip a coin so it lands on its edge. Boom. Thanks. Right? There's a video. Um, and I kept going, going, going. 14. 14 edges out of 10,000 flips. I believe the old circular pound coin is the most likely to land on its edge of all the coins. That's my theory, uh, and it seems pretty likely. I couldn't believe I almost got an edge just... Uh, right, right. And so if you, if you ever want to pass, in my experience, three days of your life, um, <laughs> get involved. Okay, so uh, I think we've done enough uh, ridiculous... Um, bits of probability will go back to the show as I originally planned. Oh, and to be honest, <clears throat> I, am, I am quite glad. Right? As a great example of probability, if you do something often enough, weird things will happen. I like the fact that we got three probabilities in a row. I think that's actually quite a good, um, <laughs> quite a good message. Although the bizarre thing is, this is the first time I have ever done this talk, right? And it happens straight away. Uh, <laughs> And for those of you watching the video, it's because we sat here and kept spinning it until we got probability every single time. This is the most patient audience I've had for some time. Uh, and this is a lesson in not believing things you see on the internet. So, good moral. Man, the second one took forever. Okay, so, um, okay, yeah, that's not the actual moral of the story. Okay, uh, I'm going to bring on my final guest and show you one more thing and then I'll wrap up. And as was mentioned at the beginning, there are uh, books available on the way out. I'm also doing a show at the Edinburgh Fringe coming up and I'm doing a book tour afterwards, which is completely different to this. So if you, if you watch this or you watch this online, I'm doing shows afterwards about Humble Pie, but I've deliberately made this a special show just for the Royal Institution because um, I'm not doing that again. Um, and so, uh, so if you see me on tour, it'll be a totally different show, and uh, it'll be great to see you at some of the shows. Right, so the very last thing I'm going to show is, is a problem, once again, with engineering. So we did uh, structural, like civil engineering. We're now going to look at, well, an engineering that brought down a... Uh, rocket. There was a rocket, the Ariane 5 rocket, which was being launched by ESA, and 40 seconds after it took off, it exploded. Thankfully, it was unstaffed, right? There were no humans on board. It was just payload of other spacecraft. But of course, someone had built those spacecraft, and they were obviously very attached to them, and a simple mathematical error caused the rocket to explode, and the spacecraft rained down on the swamp underneath. And I will explain what the mass mistake was in a second, but the bits of spacecraft, they then sent them back to the people who had made them and were waiting to send them into space and to show us the mangled bits of spacecraft from the Mullard Space Science Laboratory at UCL, please welcome Lucy Green. <laughs> Do you want to go get them? I'll yeah. get them. I'll get them. I say welcome, she's going to arrive and then go away again and then come back. So I asked Lucy very kindly if she could go and find the bits of spacecraft. Do you want to very carefully, well, we'll wheel it out the front here. So these are, so what, what, what spacecraft was this? So these are bits of instruments that we flew on the cluster spacecraft. So there's four of them actually, so four of them. All on the same rocket. All on the same rocket. <laughs> yeah, that was a big mistake. <laughs> and, and they posted them back to the lab. Yes, so when the um, rocket obviously came down, as you said, not that long after launch, um, it fell into the swamp in French Guiana. And so the European Space Agency had people who could go out and rescue the rocket and get the pieces back. So we then got our instruments sent back. And apparently, it was sort of, I wasn't there at the time, but the story goes that we got the box and they opened it up and there were still bits of swamp in it and bits of our instrument too. So this is one of the brains of one of the instruments on cluster. So we built the instrument that measures, um, well, we can talk about what the mission did, but it... it was sent up to study the environment around the Earth, so the magnetic field of the Earth and the particle environment. And this is the brains of the instrument that measured the electrons in the environment around the Earth. 
And what, what research do you do? You're a... So, my research is really related. I study the sun, and I'm interested in how the sun's activity impacts the Earth's magnetic field, creating something called space weather. And this cluster mission was designed to study space weather. So, one of the things it did was look at the physical processes behind the generation of the aurora, the northern lights. And the aurora are generated by solar activity. That sounds useful. I mean, I say, what do you do like I don't know? I'm actually married to Lucy. Just, uh, <laughs> just so we're... Because oh, otherwise, that was quite, I thought it was quite convincing. If your parents are watching, they're like, he never asked. Um, so, so we've got meteorite rings. Look at us, uh, nerds. Uh, you, you go, that's fine, it's fine. I assume you're wearing it. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> You're wearing the gloves, by the way, so, because why do you have to wear gloves handling this? Well, because we think it's probably still covered in rocket fuel. So and that's I not good for you. It's not good for you. I don't want to get it on my hands and go and eat my dinner later. But, I mean, it's pretty cool to see these bits that are completely mangled up. And normally our instruments don't come back. So these bits were built in our laboratories, and um, now we've got them back again. I think on one of them there was a little tag that said UCL's Mullard Space Science Laboratory. So someone's like, you know, if found, please send it home to us. <laughs> they figured that would take, you know, millions of years and be some distant civilization, yeah. but no, it was yeah. within a... So oh, see. that's... <laughs> and so when you arrived, you, you started working there just after this had happened. Just after this had happened. So... When we launched the spacecraft, of course, we want to have a big party. Everyone gets together to celebrate. And they'd bought champagne to drink after the launch. And I arrived about two years later, and that champagne was still there, sadly, undrunk. Yeah. But, I mean, we could talk about the success story because we did go on to rebuild these instruments. So, so they were launched again? They were launched again, yes. So the European Space Agency gave us the money to rebuild the instruments, and it took much less time. So within four years, they had been rebuilt and relaunched. And they're still running? And they're still running. So we launched in 2000, and what are we now, 2019? The ones that are in space now are still operating successfully. Because ah, this blew up in 96. 96. So they really did turn it around yeah. quite quick. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And so we actually, we were chatting to uh, a friend of yours. And we didn't realize, literally last night, we were chatting to a friend. And she was like, oh, I was watching the live stream because my PhD was going to be on Cluster. <laughs> and so she was a first year PhD student watching yeah. the live stream. And we were like, what happened? And she was like, the room was silent. <laughs> and then everybody left. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, and she's like, well, different PhD, I guess. <laughs> um, and so, so where do these live now? Where so these live in my department, and we have some on display because, as I said, we built four instruments, so we've got quite a lot of this mangled um, hardware. And we, we're, yeah, we keep them out. We talk to people about the mission, talk about what we, went, what, you know, what we did successfully to launch again, and I think it just serves as a reminder that it doesn't always work. No. Okay, so uh, we'll wheel these off uh, okay. before I actually touch them. Uh, so they're have a big round. They're broken already. They're broken. They're broken. <laughs> okay. Round of applause for Professor Lucy Green. That's all right. People spend so long working on a spacecraft. Like a mission is decades to get it to work. And they have some of them out in the coffee room at the lab, right? Just like in a glass case. So a reminder for the next generation of space scientists that your decades of work may disappear in a fraction of a second and land in a swamp. <laughs> and what happened with that was there was one sensor in the navigation part of the Ariane 5 rocket, which, well, so this part of the rocket took input from several sensors, it took the raw data coming in from those sensors, converted it into meaningful navigation information, and then sent that to the main processor that was kind of driving the rocket, if you will. And when the numbers were coming in, they had to work out how big they were going to be, because you have to allocate a certain amount of memory. And they tended to allocate just 16 bits, 16 ones and zeros for a value coming in. But some of them might be bigger. They could be up to 64. And so what they did, because they could have just written something in the program which was, for every input that comes in, check how big it is before you try and send it into the memory. But that's quite processor intensive, and they had quite you know, strict limitations on, you know, how much power they were allowed to use. And so instead of checking every single sensor, they looked for all the sensors which could give a number bigger than 16 binary digits, and they would check those to avoid any problems. And the ones that never could be that big, they didn't bother checking, right? And they could save some processing. And that all worked really, really well 
on the Ariane 4. They then copied it into the Ariane 5 without double checking. And because of a different takeoff trajectory and because of the way the sensors worked, one of the sensors that previously wasn't being checked, well, continued to not be checked, but now should have been checked. And it actually didn't have to be on. They just left it on after launch. It was a pre-launch sensor because if there was ever a, a go to launch and then they aborted before takeoff and then they reset, it took forever to reset. So they didn't turn them off straight away. They let them run for a while and then turn them off once they were sure it was definitely uh, you know, safe. However, it continued to run as it took off. It got a value that was too big. It didn't fit in the memory it put it in. It rolled over to the memory next to it and the whole thing crashed. And uh, well, which, which in and of itself wouldn't have been the worst thing because it could have you know restarted or something. Except it was designed to give a crash report. So you know, like like the stereotypical, someone's like, oh, you know, tell my spouse I love them, right? But this is like, ah, oh, tell my debugger the following crash context information, right? And so it sent the debug message up the same link to the main processor, which didn't know that could happen. It thought it was navigation data, thought the rocket had suddenly gone off to one side, tried to correct, except it hadn't gone off to one side, and the correction threw it off to one side. <laughs> it tore it apart, the self-destruct sequence kicked in, and because a 64-digit number was tried to put in a 16-digit space, right, this whole rocket uh, exploded and possibly because the spacecraft weren't insured, which is amazing. However, ESA did decide to refund it, right? So one slight mass error can have phenomenal implications. Um, and that, that is pretty much it from me. I guess in conclusion, I, I started with the theory of are mistakes important? And in some cases, yes, it, we have to get the mass right. I mean, we'll get it wrong occasionally, but we have to get it right in a lot of these critical situations. And that means we need people who are good at maths and are prepared to put the effort in. Because with maths, we can do more than our brains were originally built to do, right? We can go beyond our intuition, which I think is incredible. But ironically, to get mathematicians and people who are prepared to put the effort in and work hard, and more importantly, come up with systems that accept that humans will make mistakes, and we can use our same mathematical logic to have robust systems where mistakes don't become disasters, to have all of that, we need people who weren't afraid to make mistakes to learn mathematics, right? So I guess the other goal of my book, as well as showing people all the incredible critical mathematics that underpins our modern society, I also wanted to encourage people to have a go. Maths is difficult, but the people who enjoy maths are not the people who find it easy. They're the people who enjoy how difficult it is. It's hard work. You get it wrong, but gradually it will teach your brain how to think, and gradually you will get better and better at mathematics. So uh, I will be around physically here signing books if you want to get one afterwards. This video will end up on the internet. If you're watching it on the internet, you can order it from. Um, that is not a mistake in the URL. It only works if you put the dot in the wrong spot because I think I'm hilarious. Uh, so actually, Penguin will like, but it doesn't work if you put the, like, an umble-pi.com doesn't work. And I'm like, yeah, people have to earn the book. And they're like, we don't think you've understood marketing, Matt. Um, so I will also be around signing books and calculators. At this point, though, I am done. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much for making that work. Okay.